There are a few things that are often told to those looking to get into speedrunning. Advice along the lines of, you have to practice a lot, or play a game you enjoy, and just try to have fun with it, are all common examples, but try to avoid a game with too much RNG is pretty common advice as well. This makes sense, as RNG can generally be frustrating and quickly turn new runners away from speedrunning entirely. However, the advice that RNG is to be avoided is simply incongruent with the reality of speedrunning. Roguelike games are defined based on their randomness, yet they're simply great speedrun games. But why? On paper, they honestly seem terrible. By design, they contain a massive amount of RNG, they're very easy to die in, and all are brutally punishing. A mistake doesn't mean that you get set back a few seconds or even a minute, it means starting over completely. So for this video, we're going to explore why roguelike games are popular to speedrun, and honestly, what makes them great. An obvious issue with roguelikes is the copious amounts of RNG, but there's an obvious solution to this problem, right? The vast majority of roguelike games have options to seed your run, making almost all RNG predetermined and predictable, fixing this problem entirely. However, seeded runs are generally less enjoyable. This is likely due to how insanely broken most roguelike games can be, and seeded runs guarantee that the run will be as broken as possible, usually making the game a cakewalk to run. Seeded runs will almost always be considerably faster than unseeded runs because of this, but that doesn't really mean much. I've often seen the misconception that speedrunning is about beating a game in as little time as possible. And while this isn't technically wrong, it's entirely too simplistic. Speedrunning isn't about getting the lowest time, it's about getting the lowest time using a set of rules that select for a particular skill. To beat a dead horse, I'll use Celeste as an example. If the goal of speedrunning was to beat the game in as little time as possible, then Celeste would be an entirely dead game. The presence of assist mode, which plays the game for you, means that a time of 4 seconds and 284 milliseconds is the fastest time possible. It's impossible to even get somewhat close with an actual run, so dead game, right? Well, no, not at all. No one seriously runs that category because it doesn't select or test for any particular skill. However, any percent is run extensively because it selects for technical ability, proper timing, and precise movement control. Similarly, seated runs fail to select for the basic skills that drive most roguelike speedrunners to want to run the game in the first place. The necessity of quick thinking, along with the prospect of having a run with amazing RNG, drives most of these runners to enjoy these types of games, so removing these aspects completely removes the reasons to run roguelike games in the first place. Seated runs are useful, however, as they can oftentimes serve similarly to a TAS run in other genres, giving runners an idea of the absolute fastest a run could theoretically go. While it's incredibly unlikely that any runner can play a game with the same precision that a TAS can, and equally unlikely that any run would have luck on a similar scale to a seated run, it gives runners an idea of where the upper limits of the run lie. However, since seated runs aren't really roguelike games at all, as RNG is almost entirely absent, for the remainder of this video, we'll be discussing unseated runs. We've already discussed why eliminating RNG entirely can be harmful, but efforts to reduce the influence of RNG can be quite effective without breaking the run. RNG manipulation differs based on the game. For example, in Slay the Spire, boss encounters are extremely important, as certain strats are almost completely ineffective against certain bosses. Through manipulating the fact that the game introduces all nine of the bosses to new players in a specific order, it is possible to ensure that all of the bosses you encounter are the ones that are best. Namely, the Slime Boss for Act 1, the Collector for Act 2, and Donu and Dekka for Act 3. Other games such as Spelunky remove some randomness by rewarding versatile players. This is done by having variable categories and endings, each which have their own triggers. Oftentimes, a runner might change what category they're doing midway through the run and end up completing an entirely different category than they initially intended. This often happens because they satisfied the triggers for another ending quickly enough to complete that category instead. Other games, such as The Binding of Isaac, attempt to manipulate RNG when possible, but mainly rely on resetting over and over until ideal starting conditions are met, with a treasure room containing a viable item bordering the starting room. Once these conditions are met, the runners simply play it out, unless particularly bad RNG or a mistake occurs. 
this conversation about manipulating RNG might be somewhat confusing, as I just finished explaining why removing RNG entirely from these games essentially ruins them and makes them unappealing for most runners. However, there is an important distinction between removing RNG entirely and simply reducing it. And that distinction is centered around decisions. As I've already mentioned, there are two main draws to roguelike speedruns. The aspect of decision making and the necessity for versatility. However, for this discussion, we can mainly focus on decision making. It's easy to assume that because a run has RNG, it automatically has more decisions, but that's not necessarily the case, as options which don't save time might as well not exist, and decisions which are obviously better than every other option might as well not be decisions at all. For example, in my previous explanation of Slay the Spire's boss manipulation, it's important to keep in mind that the bosses in Slay the Spire are technically random, and without manipulation, it's possible for one of any three bosses to appear in each act. However, using the current strategies, there's never a reason to fight a boss other than the boss slime, the collector, and Donu and Dekka, as these are almost objectively the easiest bosses to kill. There might be six other options, but since they're all objectively slower and less efficient, they might as well not exist at all. Similarly, seeded runs remove decision making entirely. Since all options are known, they can be planned for and pathed out, which makes everything predictable, and boils down a run to simple execution and pathing. However, RNG manipulation simply attempts to remove particular bits of RNG which don't give any sort of option, and simply serve to frustrate runners. Analogies aren't really my thing, but if RNG manipulation is a gardener picking off a few dead leaves from an otherwise healthy plant, seeded runs are that same gardener cutting down the entire garden for the same reason. This isn't to say that seeded runs are necessarily bad or inferior, and as I've mentioned, they do serve a purpose. And while some people enjoy them, they simply go too far in removing what makes roguelike games unique. Well then, what's the consensus? Should you run roguelike speedruns? Well, sure, of course. If heavy RNG and all its downsides don't dissuade you and you think you'd enjoy it despite that, then of course you should. But in reality, roguelikes just aren't for everyone, and that's okay. I think that oftentimes it's easy to confuse a game that appeals to many runners as a game that's good for speedrunning, when that's not necessarily the case. While some games have many players due to being amazing speedrun games, others do because of social aspects and other factors. A game with 10 dedicated runners is not necessarily any worse for speedrunning than a game with 150 dedicated runners. Roguelikes might not appeal to a massive audience, but for those who do enjoy consistently new experiences and value versatility and quick decision making, they're honestly perfect. A game like Ocarina of Time might be a classic and phenomenal speedrun game, but it will never require versatility in the same way as Slay the Spire, The Binding of Isaac, or Spelunky. It might be somewhat cliche, but it's important to keep in mind that most speedruns are good for different reasons, and that the difference between reasons doesn't make a run any better or worse. Speaking of cliche, this is the part of the video where I thank you for watching, and I remind you that subscribing and sharing this video is the best way to help my channel grow. There's never been a better time to subscribe as beginning this week, I'm going to be putting out twice as many videos per week, which means twice as much quality content for you guys. As always, please leave your thoughts on roguelike games or the video in general down below as it helps me understand what you guys like. Thank you again for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.